I'm John Foster. The vast majority of you already know that and already know that I have a doctorate in history from the University of Washington and that I'm a reference librarian upstairs. Many of you, most of you are habitués of this library in any case, so, and I'm happy to see you. You know, every year I do a series of four lectures on something, and I try and do it on something that, A, that I think you guys would be interested in, but B, something that I'd like to know more about and would like the excuse to read some books about. And I thought that I would do this year, uh, Supreme Court justices. So tonight it's going to be John Marshall, then I'm going to do Oliver Wendell Holmes, uh, John Marshall Harlan, who was also on the court with Holmes, but was very different than Holmes and had a very different role. John Marshall Harlan was often referred to subsequently and in the title of the most recent biography uh, written about him, which is quite good, uh, The Great Dissenter. And this is an interesting thing because up until that point, there wasn't a great deal of dissent on the court. This is one sort of feature of the, of the Marshall Court, that, there was, that he wrote the decisions by and large, and in all but a very few cases, there was no dissent, whatever. And then I'm going to do uh, Earl Warren, the only man to be nominated by both the Democratic and Republican parties in California as their candidate for governor one year. And so, I mean, I think these are all kind of interesting figures. Next year, I'm going to do Thurgood Marshall, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, some other judges that don't kind of fit the mold a little bit more, but we'll see what happens with, with that. So this is how things are going to go with John Marshall. We're going to talk a little bit about his biography. And so there's a lot of legal history that John Marshall is a part of, and we're really, I'm really going to limit myself here to two or three things. He was involved in a, in a number of, of, of very interesting cases, uh, not surprisingly because he was the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court for 35, 32 years, so just statistically it's, <laughs> it's not surprising. But he was involved in two that have really profoundly changed the judicial and political history in the United States, and these are Marbury versus Madison and McCulloch versus Maryland. And so we're going to talk in a little bit more detail about those, not only for their, the influence they've subsequently had on American <laughs> judicial and political history, but because of the way they, f they fit into the history of the early republic. And Marshall, as we're going to see, is an interesting figure because he fits very squarely into certain categories in the early republic and, and very much not in other respects. So he was just to sort of preview something that's going to come up in, in greater detail as we go along, a very convinced Federalist, which, of course, there were plenty of Federalists in the early Republic, but he was a Federalist in Virginia, which was much less common. Virginia was the, was the sort of the center, if you will, or the, the, the main, the central area of, uh, of anti-Federalism or Democratic Republicanism, the, the leading figures of which being Thomas Jefferson and then subsequently Madison as well. But he's very linked in to a lot of things that are going on, so, so we can get, I mean, well, it'll become clear, hopefully. <laughs> he's born on September 24, 1755 at Germantown, Virginia Colony in Fauquier County, which is in northern Virginia. Yeah, Fauquier County is up here. He's incredibly hooked in. He's, a, he's, a, he's from the sort of poorer wing of the Randolph family. The Randolphs were one of the, one of the wealthy and powerful families. And he was from the wing, his, his mother had originally eloped with someone who was uh, viewed by the family as, as an inappropriate marriage partner and had been sort of brought back. And there's, a, there's another story that goes around about an earlier relative of his who had eloped and had a child with somebody and the, her, her relatives had come and killed the guy and the child, apparently. Um, people took that stuff seriously back in, in colonial Virginia. But he's also related as a sort of a third cousin, I think, to Thomas Jefferson, uh, which is not surprising because the great families of Virginia, the, the Randolphs, the Jeffersons, the Lees, the Washingtons, they're all kind of inter, interconnected. I mean, there's a kind of what's often referred to as a tidewater aristocracy who, of people who came to the colony fairly early, who grabbed up large tracts of land and then became a kind of British aristocracy in all but name, although of, of a very different sort of cast of mind. He's mostly self-educated. He read uh, in his own library. When he was a teenager, they had a, a, a sort of a minister geez, live in their house for a while who, you know, and he read in his father's library. His father was a pretty well-read guy. His father was a surveyor by uh, trade and a lawyer. 
And eventually he moved off to Kentucky, so eventually John Marshall got bought from him his, his house, Oak Hill, and that was where he lived. But that wasn't until a little bit later. He later on, this is jumping ahead slightly, but went to university and studied law, which was unusual. He, he studied law at William and Mary, I believe, under George Wythe, who was a very famous legal scholar. But that was relatively unusual for this reason. Very often, if you were going to study law, you just read the books, and that was it. Like, I mean, that was really how Abraham Lincoln, for instance, became a lawyer. It was how, or you worked in a law office, maybe. Uh, that's how Alexander Hamilton became a lawyer. By the way, Alexander Hamilton will play an interesting role. Alexander Hamilton plays an perhaps unfortunate role in practically everything I do when it comes to the early republic. And for those of you for whom this is not already painfully obvious from having seen my other talks, I have a sort of fascination with Alexander Hamilton, and I just can't resist bringing him up whenever it becomes relevant, so I apologize in advance for, um, uh, for what I'm about to expose you to. After the Battle of Lexington conquered, he and his father both joined the Continental Army. He fights uh, under Washington at Brandywine, uh, which is a very unfortunate moment for U.S. forces. He attains a sort of position of leadership, as does his father, and becomes very enamored of George Washington. Eventually, he writes a three-volume biography of George Washington. This is, this is somewhat later on. Uh, he, was, he was prompted to do so because he served for a long time on the Supreme Court with Bushrod Washington, who was... George Washington's nephew, I believe. I, I sometimes wonder where the name Bushrod came from, but that's a matter for a different talk. But this biography of Washington was for many years the standard work on the topic, and he was really fascinated with Washington. He saw him up close. He was with the army at Valley Forge. I, I was reading a little bit about Valley Forge, by the way. Why were they there? Valley Forge was a bad place. I mean, it's not all of you will be aware of this since, you know, just as Americans, it's just something we learn, and it, it's quite correct. The winter at Valley Forge was very cold, very nasty. Uh, it was in a country that had already been pretty extensively picked over by the various armies. But he, uh, Washington, and Washington had been offered quarters further south, but he thought that if he left, if he moved south, that the British would then take that as an opportunity to move on Philadelphia, which they did anyway, but not till, not till a bit later. But so they post up at Valley Forge. It's cold. Uh, many of the men have no shoes. There's very little food there. In the middle of it, von Steuben, a Prussian officer, shows up and convinces von Steuben. He rewrote the Manual of Arms. Von Steuben's an interesting character. He becomes friends with Lafayette. He becomes friends with Hamilton, who, both of whom are there. And he, he spoke almost no English, so when he rewrote the Manual of Arms and the Manual of Drill for the Continental Army, he had to write it out in French. And then John Lawrence, who was Hamilton's best bud, who was fluent in French, would translate it from French into English. But what, what von Steuben did was introduce Prussian principles of drilling. The Prussians were famous. Somebody once said of Prussia that it was a, less a state than a military camp. Or it was an army that had a state rather than a state that had an army. It's also said of the Prussian, one of the adages of Prussian military science was that the troops should be more afraid of their officers than they were of the enemy. But what, what von Steuben did was, or Steuben as he's pronounced now, although that's, Steuben is really how it should be, but he really got the, the troops drilled. They had a lot of time on their hands. And he introduced a, a great deal of discipline and a lot of, and he taught them how to sort of but move into line to fight, and that's really key. When you're facing these sort of organized blocks of troops, you have to get in there in the right way. You can't just, can't just be everybody willy-nilly. And, and not enough, one of, the, one of the sort of unfortunate qualities of American, of the, of the Continental Army prior to this point is that they had not been very efficient in the way that they conducted battles. Well, Steuben really like whipped them into shape to a great extent, and, and to that extent he he really distinctly improved the quality of Washington's army. And then finally spring came, there was a big fish run nearby, and the, the men were able to like, go fishing. And I'm sure fish got kind of tired after a couple of weeks, but it, you know, 
it's better than starving, which is what they were doing before that. But during this period, Marshall is with the Virginia militia under Washington, and he becomes really fascinated with Washington. He just thinks Washington is this really fantastic guy. He has a, he has a lot of respect for Washington. And he also said that it was during this time that he became, he sort of took up the opinion that he was, that he was not so much a Virginian, but an American. Like, he became a real American nationalist in a way that was a, not totally uncommon, but people tended to identify with their state. I mean, there's a reason why, not that I want to get too far into the weeds in this direction, but why in the first clause of the Second Amendment it says, a well-ordered militia being necessary for a free state. They don't say a free country, they say a free state. And getting up into the Civil War, I mean, a lot of those guys, Robert E. Lee, for instance, Robert E. Lee said that he just could not serve against Virginia, his home state. But Marshall came in this period, and he really linked it to service in the, in the Revolutionary Army, in the Continental Army, uh, came to feel kind of national consciousness, which is, which is growing in the United States, or in what becomes the United States at this, at this time. And so this is a key, a key feature, because it puts him on one side of a struggle that breaks out during the early republic, especially after, after 1787 and the meeting of the first Congress after the adoption of the Constitution of 1787. This is a monument, the, the cabin that he was born in, he was, you know, like it's, this, it's the standard story, right? He was born in a, in a little log cabin in Fauquier County. This is Oak Hill where his father, which his father owned, it's, it looked like that pretty close even back in the day. He bought this from his father in 1785 after the end of the war. By that time, he had bought his way into a legal practice in Richmond. Uh, he bought the law practice of Edmund Randolph, who was his cousin. Randolph was going into politics and eventually became the governor of Virginia. Just to sort of give you a, a taste of what kind of guy he was, for a long time, a member of the Richmond Coits Club. Does anybody know what Coits is? It's kind of like horseshoes, except you play it with rings, either metal rings or sometimes like bits of stiff rope connected at the ends and you have like a stick out at the end and you throw it. And it but it's kind of like horseshoes in most other salient respects. And the, the Richmond Coits Club was, was a bit more elevated than that sounds. That is to say, it was a, an organization that had a fixed membership and that could, you, could only be, uh, you could only be a member if you were asked to be a member. But every week they would have a barbecue and play coits, and it was a sort of, it was a way of kind of like important people in Richmond, like being a, being a member, and as a matter of fact, after John Marshall died, a spot was created for him permanently, so his spot was not, was not filled in the Richmond Coits Club. But I, he was a very down-to-earth guy. He, you know, there's a funny, there's a story about him when he was, I, I think he, at this point he was in the, in the Virginia House of Delegates, that somebody, like he ran into somebody outside a store and said, you know, the guy was like, I'll give you five bucks to take this stuff that I bought up to my house, and he did it. And, you know, he was just a, he was a kind of a down-to-earth sort of guy. He had some more unfortunate qualities, which we'll, which we'll talk about a little bit toward the end, but he's not like Hamilton, okay, in this respect. Hamilton, Hamilton and Jefferson, okay, hated each other. This is not news, especially if you've Seen the musical, I've, I was talking to some, one of my coworkers earlier, I think the musical is fabulous, because Lin-Manuel Miranda did it right off Ron Chernow's book. It's one of the few sort of historical productions that you, could, that you don't, that as a historian I don't find myself going, no, that didn't happen. Like pretty much everything in there is, is, is legit, as far as I can tell. I mean, I'm not an expert at the early republic, I'm just a, a person who's read a lot of books about it. But, so Jefferson and, and Hamilton hated each other. Jefferson thought Hamilton was a monarchist and a pedant, you know, a know-it-all, which was true. I mean, the monarchist part, you can sort of argue about it, but he gave that, those many of you have probably heard me tell the story of the five-hour-long speech he gave in the middle of the Constitutional Convention of 1787, in which he was going on about how the British monarchy was the greatest form of government ever, and he got to the end and it was like, okay, that's, that's definitely not what we want. Thank you for summing up exactly, exactly what we won't be doing. But, you know, Hamilton thought of Jefferson, Hamilton thought Jefferson was a, was a dilettante and a, and a hypocrite. Because 
he, Jefferson talked about freedom and he had all these slaves and he didn't just have them, you know, he also uh, had relations with Sally Hemings and which was kind of known, there's a, just to digress for a moment, Jefferson took her with him to Paris and Hamilton's sister-in-law was there. Hamilton's sister-in-law, whose name was Schuyler, and I, her first name for, escapes me, but she was, a, she was a renowned beauty and a renowned, she was the, the person that everybody wanted to be with. But she sent Hamilton this letter saying, by the way, you might want to know that, and Hamilton at one point, I think, kind of threatened Jefferson with, with sort of putting the information around. Jefferson also like hired a guy, hired a, a, a a gutter journalist to start a newspaper just to write scurrilous things about Hamilton. So there was, there was justified ill feeling on both sides. But Marshall, who's very much, uh, I mean, he's a pretty well-educated guy. He's very self-educated, but he's, he's pretty well-read. But he's not, he hasn't got that, like, overweening intellectualism that, that Hamilton has. He's a very smart guy, and he has some very well-thought-out ideas about the law. Uh, but he also... Uh, really, really disliked Jefferson, and the feeling was really mutual. And partly it was because Marshall pretty quickly moved, well, part of it, but there's, I mean, there's many factors, but part of it was that Marshall was very much associated from an early date with the Federalist side. The Federalists are much more sort of heavily concentrated, if you will, up toward New England. I mean, there's a reason why, too, like if you look at at the, the early presidents, they're all from Virginia, except for Adams. Adams is kind of the last Federalist, basically. Washington has sort of very Federalist tendencies. So after the war, he serves from 1755 until uh, 1780. And then uh, he gets elected, he takes up a law practice in Richmond. He gets elected to the House of Delegates. You know, he makes it clear, you know, this is a time that the United States is being run under the Articles of Confederation. And the Articles of Confederation have, I think, quite justifiably taken a beating because it was very hard to get anything done under the Articles of Confederation. They were very much the sort of Democratic-Republican form of government par excellence. Every state got one vote. The central government, when it had to raise money, was forced to just ask nicely, and mostly the answer was no or just to be ignored. This is also a time when Shays' Rebellion breaks out in Western Massachusetts, 1786 and 1787. Uh, Shays' Rebellion was a sort of uh, tax revolt. And it's, it's a kind of interesting illustration of another interesting, uh, sort of another dynamic that goes on in the early republic, which is uh, farmers and their relation to banks. Farmers really dislike banks because of the sort of, the way, you know, so farmers need a lot of money at certain times, right, when they have to buy seed. And then, but they have to wait, right? Because you just plant the seed and it doesn't just come up tomorrow. Like you have to wait and you're subject to all kinds of vicissitudes until it does. So there's a big problem with debt among farmers. I'll just tell you the following. I grew up in Eastern Washington, which is a big, uh, among other things, big wheat country. And there's a joke that you hear if you hang around bars and cafes in Walla Walla, Washington long enough and it goes like this. Do you hear the one about the wheat farmer who won the Washington State Lottery and the the newscaster came up to him and said, what are you going to do now that you won? And the guy's like, ah, I'm just going to keep farming until the money runs out. And that's basically, you know, it's funny because it's true. And so, you know, what you have is these people in, East, in, in Western Massachusetts who are deeply in debt. Hamilton and the central government are trying to crack down on states issuing their own money. Rhode Island was the worst violator, but, but, but also, you know, if you're a politician, and you want to get people on your side, and you're of a sort of populist cast of mind, one way to do it is easy money, right? So if you start, you know, printing lots of money and spending it into circulation, then people down the stream, so to speak, have money, you know? And if you have a debt of $500, and there's like X amount of money in the system, and then suddenly there's like 4X amount of money in the system, the value of that debt just went down. Like, so all of a sudden, like, you know, I loaned you $500 two years ago, and then all of a sudden you come to me with $500 because like money is just everywhere. The central government had to send, George Washington had to troop out there and calm people down because they were very upset. But this is, so once again, this is the influence of Hamilton on the early Republican. Uh, Hamilton was, 
a big believer in banks, but also thought that the, the, the mint, the US mint should be the only emitter of, gov of money for the reason that that would keep, it would ensure, it would give you the greatest chance of ensuring that the currency stayed stable because that's, that's the thing you really don't want is like wild swings and what the value, because once again, and it's not just farmers, you're making a, you know, if you invest in anything, you're making a bet on what, on what that asset is going to be worth months, years down the road. And if all of a sudden, I mean, this is what happened in uh, Germany in the 19, early 1920s, right? The, you know, you had all these people who had created debt relations, and then all of a sudden, like, you know, every guy in the factory just got paid 40 million marks for the last week. So they pay off all their, you know, the 2,000 marks you loan them with money that you can use to paper your walls, but not much else. And, and that's really the kind of thing, I mean, that's, Hyperinflation is a kind of a side problem, which, which is m mostly not a problem unless you've got some, a lot of other things going on. But, but what Hamilton really wanted to avoid was the situation in which the, the value of money was depleted. Like he wanted, to have, he wanted to have banks so that you could have commerce. He was more worried about commerce than farming, which is another reason that Jefferson hated him. But Marshall is for a fairly strong central government, and that, that comes out more in his jurisprudence. But while he's sort of going along, he becomes associated with the Federalist Party. He eventually gets sent to France in the 1790s. So after Adams defeats Jefferson in the 1796 presidential election, Marshall's sort of entree into politics is being at the Virginia ratifying convention for the, for the US Constitution for the Constitution of 1787, of which he is a big proponent. And he does a lot to promote this Constitution and this version of the United States. And as I've, I've said at other times, and most of you are probably aware, the Constitution of 1787 is a massive change in the way the United States is run. It's, 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 a, it's a pretty dramatic centralization of power in the, in the federal government. And part of the reason, this will come up later, but I was sort of reading something about the, the preamble of the Constitution, which is, you know, for those of us who grew up in the 1970s and saw Schoolhouse Rock, you know, you can still, I can still from, you know, I, I can recite the preamble of the Constitution, but I have to sing it, which I will spare you at, at this particular moment. But it's important, right, that when you look at the Constitution, this is the thing that's worth thinking about, about the Constitution. If there are words in the Constitution, remember that they're there because they were chosen to be there, right? So Governor Morris from New Jersey who wrote the preamble of the Constitution, every word that's in the preamble of the Constitution is in there because he means it to be there, right? So we the people in order to form a more perfect union. Why is that important? Because where does sovereignty come from? Sovereignty doesn't rest with the states. Sovereignty rests with the people and the people then invest it in the central government, right? And so I say this as if it's an obvious thing. This was a matter of extreme debate. And some people still think to this day, I think it's an incorrect reading of the Constitution. But the interesting thing about the Constitution too is that it's a living document. You know, so it's, they meant it to be, the Constitution can be changed. So it's not easy to do, and it's probably for the best that we don't most times, just because you know, we know how this one works. Like, Sometimes people are like, let's have a constitutional convention. I'm like, no, no. Like, you know, whatever problems you can see with the Constitution, it, this, we know exactly how this one works. We know what the, you know, it's like a chessboard. Like, we know where all the pieces are. And you can say, well, I think this interpretation or that interpretation is not right. But at least we know we have a text that we're all, that we're all working from. But some, you know, some people still think that that sort of intermediation of the states is isn't covered by the Supremacy Clause, or whatever. I'm gonna stop going on and, because I'm just gonna start getting into things you're less interested in. He, he was made minister to, in the, like we'd had a pretty good relationship with France in the 1780s. In the 1790s, they started like preying on our shipping. And this is a thing, like, so this is another, I'm, I'm, I know this is supposed to be with Marshall, but I'm gonna get back to Hamilton for one second, is that one of the reasons why Hamilton thought that the Constitution was important was because we had to have a unitary state. Because if you're weak, 
the law of nations will not protect you, right? And the, like the British saw this immediately. So as soon as, the, as soon as the treaty got signed, the British started trying to mess with our shipping. And then the French started in too. And the French eventually, there was a kind of a, you know, Marshall is over there with a couple of other guys and they're sort of negotiating. And there was this moment at which like three French officials came to them to try and like solicit a bribe from them. And, and it was sort of brought out into the open, but they, but they didn't say who the guys were. They just referred to them as X, Y, and Z. So it's referred to as the X, Y, and Z affair. And at that point, Marshall's like, I'm, I'm out. Like, because we're not, we're not going to pay a bribe about this. Everything we're going to do here is, is going to be above, is going to be above board. He returned to his law practice. Uh, in 1798, George Washington convinced him to challenge for the congressional seat in the 13th uh, congressional district in Virginia against a Democratic Republican candidate. Marshall won, partly because of his popularity in the wake of the XYZ affair, and partly because Patrick Henry, with whom he had very significant political differences, actually came out in support of him. Patrick Henry refused, like very famously refused to go to the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia saying, I smell a rat. But he thought that, he personally thought that Marshall was a good guy and, and would be good for the, would, be, would do a good job. And so he came out in support of Marshall and Marshall ended up winning the seat. He, at that point, uh, declined an appointment to the, as an Associate Justice of the Supreme Court. So Bushrod Johnson was appointed. He was sworn into the Sixth Congress uh, in 1799. He was nominated, he was appointed Secretary of War in, in 1800 by John Adams. He made it clear that he kind of didn't want the position, so Adams withdrew it, but then he made him Secretary of State instead. Interestingly, by the way, and, and, and this I'll sort of point out before we go further. He argued a case before the Supreme Court, Ware versus Hilton, and the, the substance of the case was a Virginia law that said that the state could cancel debts owed to British people left over from the, left over from the war. And he argued on the state side, which is ironic given the fact that like, he's a big federal government guy, and he lost eventually. And this is, I mean, so once again, like Hamilton's big thing was we got to pay our debts, right? Because if we default on our debts, we'll never get people to give us loans again. So one of the key things as far as Hamilton was concerned was if debts have been incurred, the debtors have to pay. That's it. That's just, you know, we can't, we can't go around canceling debts, which is really much more consonant in, in the long run with what Marshall was all about, ironically enough. But he did make a very favorable opinion, and I think that this, in, in terms of his legal acumen, that's Valley Forge. Should have put that in earlier, sadly enough, but whatever. Uh, this is his house in Richmond. This is people playing coits and having a high old time. Uh, having a big old barbecue was part of the deal, too. So, I mean, frankly, I'd be okay with that. He's Secretary of State, not for very long, in the sort of latter period of the Madison or of the Adams administration, Adams is a very funny, brittle man. He, according to, I think I read this in either Chernow or David McCullough, but when he would get frustrated with the people in his cabinet, as he often would, he would tear off his wig, throw it on the floor, and stomp on it. So he was just, you know, which I sort of understand because running the U.S. government in the in the late. 18th, early 19th century must have really been like herding cats. I mean, you have all these like very powerful personalities, you know, Jefferson and, and, and Madison and, and, and what have you, and, and Hamilton. Um, finally, Adams in 1801, right, as his, right toward the end of his administration, appointed him to succeed Oliver Ellsworth, who had been the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. So he became the fourth one. The only other, I mean, Ellsworth was a decent jurist, but John Jay was, had been the, the sort of first one, and John Jay is another. John Jay, I read a biography of John Jay in which the guy who wrote it said, you know, John Jay is sort of the forgotten founding father. Like, people talk more about uh, Aaron Burr than him, even though Aaron Burr is really only remembered now because he killed Alexander Hamilton, which is sad but true. Jefferson gets elected president in 1801 in a very fraught election that involves 35 ballots. And when he does, this is a big change because Jefferson is, is a very pronounced Democratic Republican. He has a very different idea about what the United States is going to be all about. 
than, than Hamilton does, than Washington did, than Adams did. He thinks that the United States should be an agrarian country, that, you know, smaller and larger farmers, and this will be the way that decent people, you know, he's very, has a very jaundiced view of people who live in cities and people who, who try to create industry. Whereas Hamilton was all about, you know, trying to, you know, we need to build up our industries if we're going to be a country that's going to, you know, be able to compete, be a country that's going to be able to hold on to what we have and also, you know, have the prospect of this, of this enormous continent now that we're, that we're on, that granted other people own large portions of right now, but if we're going to spread out of this sort of area that we're in, Hamilton's idea was, you know, we need to, we need to expand. We need to have industry. There happens uh, afterward a kind of lame duck came to be called the Midnight Judges Act, and it was an attempt to restructure the American judiciary by putting in significantly more uh, judges of a democratic of a democratic republican cast of mind. The judiciary was very heavily federalist at this point. By the way, at this point too, it's not clear that the Supreme Court is really a third branch of government. I mean, the, the idea that there's going to be a Supreme Court gets mentioned in the Constitution. But what it's going to do is much less clear at this particular moment, right? At this point, it's meeting in a basement room in the Capitol. And not that often. And it's not really seen as being co-equal with the legislative branch and the executive branch. Another thing that happens is John Adams, in the sort of dying days of his administration, sends out, sets up commissions for 40 justices of the peace. Justice of the peace was kind of a crappy job, to be perfectly honest. It didn't, it didn't involve much power and it was pretty poorly paid as well. But it was, you know, it was the kind of job that needed the great seal of the United States on the commission to be valid. And this was like right at the, right at the 11th hour, they get sent out. As a matter of fact, Marshall is the guy as Secretary of State who's responsible for sending them out. He only gets about half of them sent out. So what eventually happens is this fellow Marbury, who's supposed to be appointed, is appointed. There's a commission with his name on it, with the great seal of the United States on it. But he doesn't get his commission. And Madison, James Madison, who's Jefferson's incoming Secretary of State, and who, you know, doesn't want a whole bunch of, you know, doesn't really care about the situation of uh, justices of the peace of federalist inclination, decides, well, we're just going to not, we're just going to not worry about that. So, also, the Jefferson administration sort of basically specified that the Supreme Court wasn't going to meet that term. So this case doesn't happen until 1803. So here's Adams, there's Jefferson, there's Mr. Madison, and there's the benighted Mr. Marbury. So the case comes before the Supreme Court. Madison, who's the defendant in this case, refuses to appear because he doesn't think the outcome matters. Because it's not clear to him that what goes on in the Supreme Court should be an issue for him at all. This is, has to do with the sort of position of the Supreme Court in 1803. So, the, court get, the case gets argued. Actually, one of the lawyers arguing for Marbury is, uh, I believe, a relative of John Marshall's who doesn't recuse himself, but that's, things were a little more loosey-goosey in the early Republic. So, there's four issues of the case. Does Marbury have a right to this commission? If he has this right, does he have a remedy for his situation? If he has a remedy, what is it? And if there is an existing remedy that he can have, can the Supreme Court give him relief? Marshall's decision, which it seems fairly clear was written before the end of the arguing of the case, by the way. Marshall wrote himself the majority of the decisions in the Marshall Court. I mean, it's fairly rare that he didn't do this. But he takes on these things. First, does Marbury have a right? Yes, he does. There's a commission with Marbury's name that's been stamped by the seal, and once the seal is on it, 
That's a valid commission. So he 100% has a vested right to this, to this commission as justice of the peace. Does Marbury have a remedy? remedy? Yes, because the principle in English common law and in American law, as, as Marshall says explicitly, there are no rights without remedies. If you have a vested right, there has to be a remedy for your situation. There has to be a way that if you're denied that right, that you can be made whole again, that, that, that you, can, you have to have some sort of am, avenue. Because if you don't have a remedy, then you don't have a right. Like if I have the right to fly, <laughs> that's, that's great. But unless I have some sort of remedy for the fact that I can't fly myself, it's, I might as well not have that. The, the right is, you know, doesn't make any difference. What is that remedy? And what they were asking for is what's called a writ of mandamus. Mandamus in Latin just means I command it. And what a writ of mandamus is, most of you, many of you probably know, but what it is is it's a command from a court to some inferior official or body to do something. So what Marbury is asking for the court to do is issue this writ to the Secretary of State, James Madison, to compel him to give out this commission. And this is a big deal, right? Because Madison is not 100% convinced, as a matter of fact, very unconvinced, that this is relevant to him, that the court has any business telling him to do this, right? And so what's set up here is a possible severe conflict, right? Because if Marshall comes out and says, well, yeah, I'm granting this writ of mandamus, and Madison says, well, forget you. Then you have a, then you have a conflict. Then you have, and, and Madison is in power right now as the, as the Secretary of State. So if he says, no, I'm not interested in this, then the, the, the importance of the court takes a serious blow, right? Because then the, the other part of the federal government, the executive branch in this case, has showed that it doesn't care, right? So the question here is, does the court have right of judicial review? And this is one of these things that is going on, continues to be a, an issue in modern jurisprudence, not so much in the United States, it's pretty much settled here, like we've decided the Supreme Court has, has the right. But if you look at what's going on in Israel right now, one of, the, one of the big deals that's going on is that the parliament has passed a law saying that the Supreme Court, limiting the Supreme Court's ability for judicial review. Now, some people argued at the time, well, why should the court, which is not elected, get priority over the people? The will of the people, as expressed by their congressional representatives, is these laws. But the, you know, the, the Federalists came back and said, well, look, you, know, you can make laws, that, that's great, but we, need to, we can't have laws that don't comport with what's in the Constitution. If we're going to have a Constitution, we can't then be going around making laws that, don't, that aren't consonant with what's in that Constitution. Can the Supreme Court grant him relief? Well, it's complicated, but the shorter answer is no. Uh, and here we see the true brilliance of, of John Marshall, because what he says is, in a lot of respects, if you read the decision of Marbury versus Madison, he spends about the first three quarters of it talking about the justice of, Ma of Marbury's claims, of how, you know, and how a writ of mandamus would be the appropriate thing here. But then he says, but he, what he doesn't want, he wants two things. One is he wants to establish the, the, the court's right for, for, to execute judicial review. But he does not want a conflict with Madison. So what he says is, the Supreme Court was given the right to issue writ of mandamus by the Judiciary Reform Act of 1789, which was passed during the first Congress held after the, the adoption of the Constitution. What he says is, that's actually unconstitutional. So in fact, because the Judiciary Act is unconstitutional under the Eighth Amendment, the Eighth Amendment, let me make sure I, <laughs> because Jason is filming this. Oh, excuse me, not the Eighth Amendment. Article Three of the Constitution, thank you. Uh, okay, I've, <laughs> I've just avoided a whole bunch of posts on this. 
<laughs> Article 3. So because the, the Judiciary Act of 1789 is not constitutional, the court can therefore, the Supreme Court can therefore not issue a writ of mandamus. And in fact, what Marshall says is, this is the wrong venue. It should have been in the, in the DC court to begin with. And this is, it's just absolutely brilliant. Eventually it all goes away because, because Marbury finally says, okay, I, I give, you know, and because it's going into another administration anyway. But simultaneously, Marshall has done two things. He has established judicial review as a principle. Why? Because he's come out and said, look, as the Supreme Court, we're reviewing this law and, and we have the right to do so. Does anybody say no? No? Good. Okay. We're moving on. But he then avoids coming into direct confrontation with the Jefferson administration by issue, which would have, would certainly would have happened if he'd issued the writ. Numerous historians that I've read on this topic, and I agree with them, say that this is the, the most important of Marshall's rulings. Because judicial review essentially creates the third branch of the federal government. And it's important because even though we, I'm, I'm sure every one of you has like looked at Supreme Court rulings and been like, my God, that's nonsensical. I, I disagree with Supreme Court rulings. I'm sure you've all disagreed with Supreme Court rulings. But it's important that they're there. Right? It's important, you know, I think that certain things, they just, they've misread the Constitution, but that's fine. Smart, they're smart people and they've read it. And, and I'd rather that we have people comparing the laws of the country to this standard to make sure that they're, so at least there's a reasonable argument about the, them being consonant with each other, as opposed to the, you know, Congress just being allowed to make laws willy-nilly, irrespective of what's in the Constitution. And people complain now you hear this from, from certain quarters that, you know, things are going on that, that aren't in the Constitution. A lot of those, I think, are based on people not thoroughly reading the Constitution, which is a, a fascinating and kind of complicated document, but one that, you know, was meant to be read by you and me. I mean, it's not meant to be some sort of arcana that normal people can't understand, but you, you got to be clear about what's in it. And that brings us to the second of Marshall's major cases. In 1819, Marshall presided over McCulloch v. Maryland. And McCulloch v. Maryland was a, it was a case over the foundation of the Second National Bank, or the existence of the Second National U.S. National Bank. And here we get into the last time that I'm going to mention Madison, prob or uh, Hamilton, probably. Probably. Hamilton, when he was serving in the Washington administration, was asked by Washington to submit a paper, that was how Hamilton worked, on the desirability of a national bank. And he did. It was about 40 pages long. I don't recommend trying to read it um, for, for reasons that will come up. And then Jefferson said, well, that's unconstitutional. Where in the Constitution does it say the government can charter a national bank? So then Hamilton issued another paper. It's about 25 pages long called On the Constitutionality of a National Bank, in which he argued about it in minute, minute detail. And I'm going to read you a little bit of it. Uh, in, in a couple minutes here, just to, just to, so you can see, but Hamilton, more often than not, people would his his response to people criticizing him would be he would like write these like voluminous reports, which were argued with incredible precision. At, at which point, people would finally be like, okay, okay, whatever, I'm going to do something else. And that's you know I think that that's really an interesting an interesting feature of him. So there had been a first national bank of the United States whose charter had eventually run out in the 1790s. But the reason to have a national bank, right, is to make credit more available, uh, mostly for industry, but also for farming. But the concern was, or on the Democratic-Republican side, well, it's twofold. One, A, it's unconstitutional, and B, it will encourage speculation. So if you can get these loans, right, you'll get people like the guy in It's a Wonderful Life, who's offering to buy everybody's shares at, at a 50% haircut. And, 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 and what they don't want to do is encourage that because that's, you know, speculation should be, John Maynard Keynes once said, speculation should be like the froth on the top of the stream, not the stream itself. So once again, there's this very pronounced distinction between the two groups, between the Democratic Republicans and the Federalists on this topic. 
And the state of Maryland decided, well, there was a, there's, a, there's an Ohio dimension to this too, which some of you may have heard me talk about. But at this, at this point, McCulloch was a clerk at the bank in Maryland. And Maryland basically said, well, if you're going to issue, anyone who's going to issue these, going to do this banking business, has to pay a $15,000 tax. So they tried to get McCulloch to pay it, and he refused. And so the, the point was, should, does the state of Maryland have the right to tax a federal government institution? Well, it shouldn't, right, because of the supremacy clause. Like the, you know, the, so the, the federal government can't be sort of like, can't be taxed by the lower, the lower parts of the, of the state. But that's neither here nor there with respect to the, the constitutionality of the, of the bank. So Marshall argues, it's been done before, right? In 1791, we had the first. So, so Marshall rules in favor of McCullough. And he says, number one, okay, we've already had a national bank, which you, you didn't seem to have a problem with it then. So if you have a problem with it now, why? Number two, and this gets back to what I was saying about the preamble. We the people, in order to more, form a more perfect union. Not we the states. I mean, we're the United States, but we the people, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general f welfare. Uh, and it's not ensure the blessings. What is it? And sing it. I, if, if, if I sing it, I'll get it right, but I'm, like, I'll just be roasted online. So um, and ensure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. The, the, um, the people are sovereign. Not the state. So the state doesn't, like, the, the government has the right to do this because the government, the federal government, is a representative of the people. Okay, maybe not, neither here nor there. Okay, it's not specified in the Constitution, but lots of things aren't. It's a Constitution. It's not a legal code. If everything that could happen in the country was specified in the Constitution, then it wouldn't be the Constitution. It would be the legal code, and it would be completely unwieldy. So that's why we have the federal revised code. That's why we have the Ohio revised code. That, you know, like, the laws are based on the Constitution, but they aren't the Constitution. So just because it's not explicitly mentioned in the Constitution doesn't mean it can't happen. But here, finally, we get to the key piece of reasoning and why this, with the exception of Marbury, is the most important thing that John Marshall ever did. Article 1, Section 8 of the Constitution. Article 1, Section 8, uh, specifies in as much detail as ever found in the U.S. Constitution what the Constitution or what the powers of Congress are. Congress will have the power to lay tax and collect to lay and collect tax dues. By the way, you know sometimes people will come up to me and say, "Well, you know, the power to tax isn't in the Constitution." Yeah, it is. It's explicit in the Constitution because that's the problem it was meant to. The Constitution was meant to fix. Like, so if they fix nothing else, I mean, nobody likes taxes. I certainly don't, as we say, coming up on April 15th. But I know that Congress has the right to do it, sadly enough, to borrow money on the credit of the United States, to regulate commerce, on and on and on and on and on. Until we get down to, to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers and all other powers vested by this Constitution in the government of the United States or in any department or officer thereof. This is often referred to as the necessary and proper clause. And it is one of the most fraught clauses in the entire document, but one that's absolutely key. Now, in focusing on this, Marshall cribbed clearly off of Hamilton. And I'm going to read you a, a, a passage. This is a fairly significant passage from Hamilton's On the Constitutionality of a National Bank, just to give you the, the flavor of what Hamilton was on about. This is Hamilton. It may w truly be said of every government, as well as that of the United States, that it has only the right to pass such laws as are necessary and proper to accomplish objects entrusted to it. For no government has the right to do merely what it pleases. Hence, by a process of reasoning similar to that of the Secretary of State, this is Jefferson in this case, it might be proved that neither of the state governments has the right to incorporate a bank. 
it might be shown that all public business of the state should be, could be performed without a bank, and inferring thence that it was unnecessary, it might be argued that it could not be done because it is against the rule which has been just mentioned. A like mode of reasoning would prove that there is no power to incorporate the inhabitants of a town with a view to a more perfect police, for it is certain that an incorporation may be dispensed with, though it is better to have one. It is to be remembered that there is no express power in any state constitution to erect corporations. And here we get to something key. The degree in which a measure is necessary can never be a test of the legal right to adopt it. The degree. So, right. Is it ne necessary is like pregnant. <laughs> you either are or you aren't. It either is necessary or it's not necessary. And it can be very necessary or not very necessary. But the question here is not to what degree is it necessary. The question is, is it necessary and proper? By proper we mean, uh, does it violate some other part of the Constitution? So what, what's being said here is, the government has the right to enact whatever power the, right, the government has. It has the right to make laws to make that happen, just as long as those laws don't violate some other explicitly specified part of the Constitution. The degree in which a measure is necessary can never be a test of the legal right to adopt it. That must never be a matter of opinion and can only be a test of expediency. The relation between the measure and the end between the nature of the means employed towards the execution of power and the object of that power must be the criterion of constitutionality, not the more or less necessary necessity or utility. Uh, Hamilton continues on in this vein at, at, some, at some length. Is, is there one other thing that I wanted to read here? Um, I mean, he goes on at some length about the meaning of the word necessity in the way that your high school English teacher might, or your high school debate teacher might go on with. I mean, it's incredible. This is page four of a 26 page, and I'm sure that, you know, Jefferson got this thing, got through about, you know, 10 pages of it, and was like, okay, I'm just, I'm going to go back to Monticello and have a glass of wine and not think about irritating Alexander Hamilton. But if you look at what Marshall writes in his decision, he cribs it almost passage for passage out of what Hamilton has to say or, or about, about necessity and propriety. So basically what he's saying is, okay, the Constitution doesn't say that the government has the right to incorporate a national bank. But a national bank is, as Hamilton had shown otherwise, necessary to the promotion of trade. You, you cannot have trade at the right level without the National Bank. So given that it's necessary, doesn't matter how necessary, given that it's necessary, and given that it doesn't violate some other thing explicitly said in the Constitution, it is therefore constitutional. Now, this is an interesting decision for a number of reasons. One, most people actually believed that the bank was, was constitutional. It was, a, it was a kind of a... It was mostly only people on the sort of more radical wing of the Democratic Republicans who were opposed to it. Number two, as it turned out, the problem with the bank was not speculation, it was embezzlement. And in fact, I believe McCullough was subsequently arrested for embezzlement. And also, there's this very funny moment where, um, so there were two branches of this national bank in, uh, in Ohio. One in Chillicothe, if I'm not mistaken, where like, one of the officials of the state of Ohio was going to charge the bank in a way which was, this is after McCullough v. Maryland, uh, and, and in a way which was not consonant with that, like came to the money, to, came to the bank to demand, I think $150,000, was told no, jumped over the counter, went into the bank, took $150,000 and left with it. But by and large, okay, so this is still a key ruling, right? Because for this reason, sometimes you will hear people say, well, I don't see where blah, blah, blah is in the Constitution. And oftentimes they're right, right? But the question is, is such and such a law a means to the exercise of a power that the government has? Is it a necessary and proper way of accomplishing some power that, that the government has, like the promotion of trade? If that's the case, then it's ipso facto constitutional. Now, 
lots of people still disagree about this. And, and you know, there's, if, if you look on Google, you will not have to search very far to find people who think that that's just the thin edge of the wedge of government oppression. So by the 1820s, uh, federalism was in decline. This is the, the sort of beginning of the Jacksonian era. Jackson dislikes Marshall and federalism generally. Jackson then refused to renew the charter of the bank because he's a populist and he doesn't trust centralizing institutions and he doesn't trust uh, banks. Basically, he thinks that anybody should be able to start a bank, essentially, if they want to. Um, he doesn't think that the government should be in the banking business. Also, at this point, the, constant, the composition of the court starts to change. So that for a long time, the court has been Marshall and his friends. Marshall would have them stay at the same rooming house in DC when they were in session. And after the session, they would go back to the rooming house and have dinner and have a few drinks and argue about the law or, or what have you. And there was a real sort of collegiality to the court in those days. But finally, Marshall uh, retires from the court in 1835. And in his place is appointed Roger B. Taney, one of the most maligned figures in American jurisprudence, the guy who issued the notorious Dred Scott decision in which he argued that uh, a black man had no rights, that a white man was legally bound to, uh, legally bound to respect. Now, before we get to the end here, I will say the following about about Marshall, for whom it, he's a guy definitely worthy of respect for a lot of reasons, not just that both Madison v. Marbury and McCullough v. Maryland are two absolutely crucial uh, bits of American jurisprudence. Madison, v, Marbury v. Madison establishes judicial review. McCullough v. Maryland establishes the power of the federal government to do most of the things that the federal government actually does. And, you know, people take a fairly jaundiced view of the federal government, but I, I you know, the, there's a, I think there's a fair argument to be made that it, that it does a lot of good. Let's think how bad things would be without it. But also, just in terms of the constitutionality of what it does, McCullough really establishes the constitutionality of a lot. You can argue whether it's a good idea whether some of the things the government does is a good idea, but the, the, it, it, it sort of mainstreams the constitutionality of a lot of what, it, of what the federal government does. But, um, so in the 1830s, we're starting to get into the real period leading up to the Civil War. Tawny is a big figure here. We have the Southerners coming out and saying, well, you know, people shouldn't even be able to talk about anti-slavery because that's an attack on our property rights. So, you know, people should, it should be, you should be able to prosecute people for that. And Tani is, you know, thinks that that's, Tani just thinks that there's no basis for any, for black people having any rights, for enslaved people having any rights. One of these times I'll do a thing on Tani if I can keep my stomach down while I do it. But I mean, he really was a, a, a person whose influence on American jurisprudence was, was pretty horrific. But this, uh, you know, it's, it's, this needs to be said about Marshall. Marshall, over the course of his life, owned probably 300 slaves. He gave them to his sons. And most of his biographers don't talk about this. There's a fairly recent book, Supreme Court Injustice, Slavery in the Nation's Highest Court, on, on practically every occasion where black or enslaved people came in front of Marbury, he ruled against them. In a number of cases, or came in front of Marshall, not Marbury, poor old Marbury, in front of Marshall, he ruled against them. And in a number of cases, even the, the, the rulings were incorrect based on the, what, the, what the law actually was. was. There's a particularly horrifying case of a, called the Antelope case in which there was a, a Spanish slaver. This was after slavery, slave trade had been outlawed. The Spanish slaver gets uh, boarded by US, the US Navy in the Caribbean. And it's pretty clear that what they're gonna try and do is, is uh, smuggle slaves in the United States. Uh, the, the case comes up in front of the Supreme Court to say whether they should be freed. They're being, the, 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 the slave people, their lawyer was Francis Scott Key, who wrote the national anthem, but who was also a very pro-slavery guy. Even Key thought that they, was, <laughs> that they should be freed, but Marshall ruled against them. Um, and his, his rule vis-a-vis -vis or his position vis-a-vis -vis slavery is ambiguous but unfortunate. Now, I mention this because it's an important issue. Like, 
And I mention it not because the, his, you know, the history of slavery is something we should all sit around and feel bad about. Like that's, I, I really abhor that sort of idea that we shouldn't talk about it because it makes people feel bad. The fact of, the history of the country is what it is. And let's be honest about it. Because if we're not, then we like, it's a lot harder to understand like things that happened later, right? And do I think that this, that this degrades Mar uh, Marshall's importance in terms of, of his jurisprudence? No, I don't. I think he made some mistakes. Uh, I think he had some unfortunate beliefs. And, and just because he was a person of that time and that place doesn't excuse him. I mean, Hamilton had some slave dealing, we now know from a close reading of his account books, which are in the National Archives, but he was also heavily involved in the New York Manumission Society. He thought that slaves should be eventually freed, and he thought that they would probably be just as good as, he thought that black people would probably be just as good as white people, I mean, he said, said so explicitly. Jefferson, okay, owned a lot of slaves and, and had an extensive intimate relationship with at least one of them. Jefferson at one point said that, you know, slavery was kind of, was like having a wolf by the ears. He didn't really like it, but like the alternative didn't seem great either. And, and I, you know, I think probably, you know, maybe in his heart of hearts, Jefferson understood that, that the institution was not right. Washington refused to engage in the slave trade after the war, after the Revolutionary War, saying that he didn't want to see, you know, men bought in markets like animals, and then manumitted all of his slaves when he died. So there were people at the time who understood. So Marshall can't get a pass from that. And I think we need to acknowledge that. But do I think we need to be, you know, um, do I think that's the only or most important fact about John Marshall? No. I mean, I think his jurisprudence is worth reading, especially, uh, especially the two cases we t I talked about at length tonight, because they were part of shaping the country's best instincts and best institutional in making the country what it is today. And, you know, are we perfect? No, but what we do tend to do well is find our way through to the sort of best solution after we've tried many of the other ones that can be got with the institutions we have. And the institutions we have have a lot to do with judicial review and the necessary and proper clause. So that's what I've got. People want to have questions, that's great. But thank you so much for your attention.